Namaste. So the response to our last episode of Atma Bodha was so amazing. It indicates to me there's a great interest in the subject of the last two videos, really, which is subconscious mental programs. And I would use the example or the metaphor of a computer. Now, I don't think the mind is a computer. This is just a metaphor to explain <laughs> the phenomena that we observe in the mind. When you first boot up a computer, there's just a blank screen and maybe some icons or whatever, but basically there's nothing going on and it'll just sit there forever until you give it a command. Once you do, you open up some program and start using a word processor or graphics or video, whatever it is. Does that mean that nothing is happening? No. Because as soon as you boot up the computer, you have something called an operating system. The operating system is a collection of programs that run invisibly underneath the surface of the graphical user interface. It appears like nothing is happening, but actually there's a constant activity, you just don't see it. And as soon as you click on something, then it makes a window and stuff appears to start happening, but it's been happening the whole time underneath. And it keeps running underneath whatever programs you have open to provide services to those programs to use in their various functions of whatever you're trying to do. The mind is similar. Like I said, it doesn't mean the mind is a computer. The mind is much more than that. But this is a simile, this is an example, this is a metaphor to help you understand the mind. When you first wake up in the morning, the mind seems blank. Does that mean that nothing's going on? Nuh-uh. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of things going on beneath the surface that you are not aware of consciously. And psychologists call this then the subconscious mind. Actually, there's no such thing. <laughs> Because any of these so-called sub-rosa, meaning invisible programs, can be accessed by the consciousness. You just have to make a little effort. So anyway, what's going on? We talked about the mula pariyaya, the root sequence that creates the impression, the appearance of I, an individual, separate individual entity uh, through a kind of sleight of hand delusion, uh, like a magician. And then we talked about superimposition, where one thing is layered on top of another thing to make it look like something else. All of these and more are going on beneath the surface of the mind, even when there's apparently no thought or effort going on. So how is this possible? Well, it's called habit. In the beginning, when we develop the root sequence, for example, it's done consciously. In early days of our life, maybe you don't remember, but if you do depth psychology, like primal therapy or something like that, you can access these memories. That in the early days of your life, you struggled to create an ego. And you finally do it by identifying this and that and the other thing as mine. Did you ever see a cat claim something? Cats do it 
by taking their paw and putting it on top. And it's like, this is mime. <laughs> Humans do it by identifying with the object and saying, this is mine. And we have a detailed explanation of the Mula Pariyaya in this series. But really, all you need to know is that the Mula Pariyaya sequence justifies the existence of I by calling so many things mine. And then after all, all these things are mine, so I must be real, right? <laughs> the mind is very tricky. It creates all kinds of illusions and dreams because beneath the surface of the conscious mind, which is called Jagrat consciousness, there's the Svapna consciousness. Svapna means dreams. When we think, or for example, talk to ourselves mentally, out loud, these are actually dreams. They're not real in the sense of being concrete gross reality. And we'll get into that in the next video, which is about the five gross elements. But before we go there, I want to talk more about what's going on in the subconscious mind. These are dreams. They're thoughts only. But they color our perception of the external reality, and they allow us to create things like the empirical self, I, the individual, the jiva, huh? the one who is born, is subject to karma, enjoys and suffers, and then dies and goes on to another body. How is this all possible? Through superimposition. Huh? You have, in the beginning, the plain self, with a capital S, pure consciousness. And then gradually, upadis are layered on top of it. I am an individual. I am a jiva. I am a man or a woman. I am a child. I am this. I am that. I am an American. I am an Indian. Blah, 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 blah. Huh? My name is such and such. My family is so and so. My country is this and that, etc., etc., etc. Until the original spark of pure consciousness is practically extinguished. And we begin to identify with these layers of upadis instead. So we think, I am this body. I am this mind. I am these thoughts. I am my name, I am so-and-so, this and that, on and on and on and on. So the question has come up in the comments, how do we deal with this? Do we have to make some kind of effort, like some kind of meditation or something, to stop this? And the answer is no, for two reasons. Number one, you'll find that if you try to make efforts to control the mind, what happens is simply the opposite. The mind gets increasingly unmanageable and out of control and can even snap into a psychotic state. This happens to some people in meditation retreats where they have no real background in the philosophy and they have no real practice day to day leading up to the retreat. And one day they just leave everything that they know and is familiar and they go to this retreat place and they just sit without talking for seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 30 days, whatever it is. A lot of these people have psychotic episodes. Why? Because they're making an effort to silence the mind. And the mind is not silent by nature. The mind is a, a mad monkey jumping here and there, chattering like crazy. That's the nature of the mind. If you try to repress it, 
it just builds up more and more pressure within, and then at some point it's going to break loose and it all hits you all at once. So this is not a good idea. <laughs> the other reason is when it's dark and you light even a single candle or a small flashlight, any single ray of light immediately banishes the darkness and you could see. In the same way, the subconscious programs are protected by a layer of ignorance. Ignorance means sushupti consciousness, that I'm not going to look at this, I'm just going to kind of let it go because it serves me in a certain way. I'm able to create and maintain an individual identity and so forth. But this is not really good for us. So then, how do we manage or control these subconscious programs? The answer is, we make them conscious. That's all. We bring them from sushupti into at least svapna consciousness, where we can be aware of the dream, of the thoughts that go up to make these subconscious programs. It's just like if we have some kind of a logic analyzer and uh, we look into the operating system of the computer while it's apparently doing nothing. And we can see all these processes and memory allocation and this and that taking place, even though there's apparently nothing going on. So in the same way, simply by knowing about these subconscious programs, we can then observe them. Because consciousness permeates and penetrates everything, even ignorance. What is ignorance? Not knowing. So as soon as we know that there are programs operating without our conscious control as habitual data processing in the subconscious mind, simply by directing our attention towards them, we can make them conscious and bring them out into the light where we can see what's going on. And just like if you walk into a room and catch someone stealing, they have the thing that they want in their hands and they're about to put it in their bag, right? And you walk into the room, what do they do? They stop. They put the thing back and they try to pretend, oh, I wasn't stealing. <laughs> In the same way, the mind, when you observe what it's doing without your conscious awareness, it stops, or at least it's greatly inhibited. After all, if you are really conscious, if you are really aware, you can't become angry, you can't become lusty, huh? You can't do something stupid without compassion or without awareness because you are aware. And automatically, awareness brings compassion and kindness and so many other things. So wisdom comes from bringing these unconscious patterns of thought into consciousness and being aware of them. And the mind is sort of embarrassed like, oh, you caught me. <laughs> and so it stops. And this is the secret to overcoming these unconscious habits of thought and coming that much closer to complete enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>